You're listening to Our Common Ground with Janice Graham, transforming truth to power, one broadcast at a time. Dr. Francis Cress Welsing was born March 18, 1935. She was an American psychiatrist and well-known proponent of black supremacist melanin theory. Her 1970 essay, The Crest Theory of Color, Confrontation and Racism, White Supremacy, offered her interpretation of what she describes as the origin of white supremacy culture. Tonight at Our Common Ground, we are proud to present in discussion with Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, The Origins of White Supremacy Culture. In this 2009 episode of Our Common Ground, we talked with her once again about her profound, significant, theoretical and analytical research and writings on global white supremacy and racism and how it manifests in America. Dr. Wilson first joined Our Common Ground in 1987. The black nation mourned when she made her transition in January 2016. Racism, and he must understand what a racist is, but if you ask him, he would, you know, if someone asked. And so I want to hear from, okay, I want to hear from Dr. Frances Chris Welsing. I want to hear her perspective on this attack because this is this is part of this is part of the racist war against us that we try to pretend does not matter, does not exist. Dr. Frances Chris Welsing, thank you so much, my sister doctor, for being with us tonight. Oh, thank you for having me. We are so much uh, in need of your counsel because of the racist attacks against people that we admire. The racist attacks uh, just keep coming. It was against our president uh, for three or four weeks. And um, then it was against our first lady. Now we have added to the list um uh, Judge Sonia Sotomayor, and it just keeps coming. And I think that one of the things that we have to do is is recognize and acknowledge that we are in a war. And if we are in a war, we have to recognize who we are in that war. I, I want to hear how we survive all of this and how how i mean how we should be responding for instance the the idea that some puerto rican woman who grew up in the bronx in the in the housing project is a racist what are your thoughts well uh you know i begin with what is the context what is the power context that that we are in and I'm a psychiatrist, and I have been a psychiatrist for the past 40 years. And my thoughts are that we it's very, very, very important that people understand the dynamics, the power dynamics of the environment that they are in. It's very much like if a person goes on a new job and... Uh, they, if they want to be successful, they have to understand what are the power relationships and power dynamics in that job place. You know, who's in charge, who does what, who can cause what to happen. And so we are in a system of racism, white supremacy. And that system is about the global white minority population, and many people don't even think about this fact of reality on planet Earth, that the white population is a tiny minority population. Fewer than one-tenth of the people on planet Earth have white skin. Nine-tenths of the people are black, brown, red, and yellow. And I maintain that beginning in the 15th century with Columbus when 
he came when Europeans came out of Europe and began to circumnavigate the planet. And they found that those men and those discoverers, explorers, whatever you want to call them, wherever they landed, they found colored people, number one. The second thing they found is if the men had sexual relations with those women, the white men had sexual relations with the non-white women, all of the children ended up looking like their mothers. Now, that's the reverse. President Barack Obama is a critical example, uh, if people need to have an example, of his mother's white, his father was black. He did not come out looking like a white person. That's because of the genetic dominance of the ability to produce skin coloration. And so he turned out as an identifiably black person, even though his mother was white. I refer to that as white genetic annihilation. And my thesis is is that once the people who classify themselves as white understood, number one, that they were a minority and that they were genetic recessive compared to the genetic dominance of people of color, they worked out, consciously, subconsciously, they worked out a global scheme for white genetic survival. And that scheme of white, for white genetic survival on planet Earth is what we now refer to as racism, white supremacy, because there are no people of color that determine what is going to happen to the lives of people who classify themselves as white. And so to go back to the comments made by Judge Sotomayor, Mayor, uh, she cannot be called a racist. She is a non-white person, self-identified as non-white, who has been a victim of racism, white supremacy, and she has the sensitivities of a person who is non-white, has been classified as non-white in a system of racism, white supremacy. Now, this is what, you know, as a psychiatrist, psychiatrists want everybody to, to terms with reality. One of the things that we were told when we were training as psychiatrists is that the role of the psychiatrist is to help people face reality, even when they are afraid to do so. And the kind of thing that we see happen, we can see it, uh, you know, starkly when we're looking at the media and cable news, uh, whether it's CNN, Fox, MSNBC, when... Um, Whenever the phrase of racism is mentioned, you immediately have people who classify themselves as white going into a hysterical reaction. You're playing the race card. You're playing the race card. To block any further discussion of racism, and I maintain that, you know, that sensitivity to block the discussion of racism, in other words, don't analyze what I am doing. Don't decode what I'm doing as a person who classifies him or herself as white because you're you're decoding what the game is all about. And so, and I say that black people, we have a way of expressing ourselves when we greet each other. We say, hey, what's happening? That phrase must be, you know, uttered a trillion times a day all across this area of the world that we call America by black people. And I say the brain produces that question, what's happening, because we have been deceived. We have been told that the system is democracy, or we might be told that the system is capitalism. In reality, the system is racism, white supremacy. This is what we as black people have experienced for the 500 years that we have been in this area of the world, having been brought 
in the form of slaves, slave labor. And slavery was a part of the system of racism, white supremacy. But we were told that, you know, this is a democracy and everybody is equal and we should all get together. Dr. Martin Luther King said we should all get together and love one another. But he was killed. And I say that if everybody on the planet, that means the nine-tenths non-white global majority and the one-tenth white minority, if everybody just decided, let's forget about what color a person is, let's everybody just get together and treat each other with respect and love one another, and if that love was translated into sexual activity, white would disappear because white is a genetic recessive trait. This is not Francis Welsing's genetics. This is Gregor Mendel's great basic genetic facts. And so as long as this is not talked about and there's a tremendous amount of pressure like, I'm the only psychiatrist in the entire world who has been talking about this behavioral phenomenon of racism, white supremacy, for the last 40 years. This is a topic that you can lose your university position talking about. There's all kinds of pressure brought to bear. Even distinguished college professors who are black, if they tried to talk about racism, they probably would, you know, be run out of the university for one reason or another. Now, they can talk about the symptoms, the things that are the fallout from the system of racism, white supremacy. For example, they can talk about police brutality. They can talk about the failure of education uh, in the so-called urban or rural centers where there are black people. Or they can talk about health disparities or health care disparities. Those are the symptoms of the problem. But no one is allowed to talk about what exactly is causing what we see decade after decade after decade after decade. Why is it that we have gone from being black people enslaved to black men being lynched and castrated to black men police being brutalized by police to black men being massively incarcerated see if we're being scientific and not emotional the question becomes why do we see this decade after decade after decade after decade why do we talk about uh, the disappearing black man why do we have to talk about these things? See, people have to, well, if, if black men, are, if young black men are in greater numbers in the prison system than in the colleges and the universities, the scientists will say why. The person who's not scientifically minded will just lament and complain and ask somebody who caused the problem to do something about it. So if we are going to be scientific, then we have to ask the question, well, first of all, it's just like assessing what's going on in a job situation. Who is in charge? Who has the final say? And in a system of racism, white supremacy, it is not a non-white person. That's why black people have to worry Barack Obama is the president. He's doing an outstanding job. He has a magnificent wife, beautiful children. Black people have to worry, is he going to be killed? Yes. Well, killed by who? Who would want to attack him? The people who are fearful of white genetic annihilation, consciously or subconsciously, would be the people who attacked him, would be the people who set up the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or Medgar Evers, and the, you know, the beat goes on. 
So we have to, you know, and this goes for, why am I talking about this? I'm not talking about this hate white people, be rude or disrespectful to white people. That's cheap, and no one should engage in that. But we have to try to establish a system of justice on planet Earth. And you cannot have a system of justice and simultaneously have a system of white supremacy, a system that is about white genetic survival by whatever necessary means as carried out in economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Those are the nine areas of people activity. And let me say this, that Neely Fuller, Jr., uh, who wrote the book, the short title is Textbook for Victims of Racism, who started writing about racism, white supremacy as a system. He's the first person to talk about racism, white supremacy as a global system that is carried out in all of those nine areas of people activity and determines patterns of thought, speech, and action. He did that starting in the mid-50s. He said he started thinking about racism when he was in the Army and on a radar site in Japan. And, you know, being up in the mountain and thinking about what was going on in this area of the world that we call America, segregation, desegregation, all of that language going on. So he started writing and thinking about this is a system of racism, and racism is white supremacy. If we go back further to the early 20th century, 1903, where Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois made the first famous conclusion that the problem of the 20th century is a question of the color line between the lighter and darker races. Now, the color line wasn't black people segregating people who classify themselves as white. No, it was people who classify themselves as white setting up rigid rules of segregation, demeanment, humiliation, killing of people classified as non-white, in particular black people. And black people get the brunt of racism, white supremacy, because we are the people who have the greatest genetic potential. We have the most skin coloration, and therefore we have the greatest genetic potential. We are perceived by people who are concerned about their genetic survival. We are perceived as the people who are the major threat to their genetic survival. And this hmm. is why black people learn before they learn how to read. If you are black, get back. If you're brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're white, you're all right. Mm -hmm. And all over this entire planet, whether the basic language is French or English or German, people of color understand this, and the overwhelming majority of people of color on the planet have color sickness that has been inculcated in their thinking about themselves because they are all victims of racism and white supremacy. So you have people in Asia trying to lighten their skins, and people in Africa trying to lighten their skins, and people in South America trying to lighten and bleach their skin, hoping to be more acceptable within the framework of the system of racism and white supremacy. So this system exists. There's not a problem that anybody can raise related to what is happening to black people in this area of the world or any part of the world that is not directly or indirectly related to the power system dynamic of racism and white supremacy. And so people can try to run away from it if they want to run away from reality. Yeah. See, We've got to take a, a break, Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, oh, that's well okay. But you have touched on four very major issues when you describe the system of white supremacy, global white supremacy. War, religion, 
foreign policy, and immigration. I'm Janice Graham, and you're listening to Our Common Ground. We speak truth to power and to ourselves, and we seek to inform you, to educate you for liberation, one show at a time. Stay with And thank you once again for being with us here at Our Common Ground at ustalknetwork.com. Our guest tonight is Dr. Frances Chris Welsing. She is an author, a psychiatrist, and she has a long history uh, of developing and expounding upon the Crest theory of, of white supremacy. And we hope that you will, as a result of uh, this discussion tonight, if you have not, uh, read her The ISIS Paper. It is one of the most popular texts of the much debated but loosely defined ideology of Afrocentricity, as we've told you in the past. But it really gives us uh, an idea. It gives us the groundwork from which to see ourselves in this country, uh, our blackness, what it means, uh, what war we are in. And uh, Dr. Kress Welsing, thank you again for being with us. And, you know, you touched on the idea that racism is a power struggle and we are the greatest victims of it and that white supremacy is a is a system, a global system in which we are the victims. And that pretty much does sound like a war. Uh, And this country is engaged in two wars that it has not declared. Uh, And I suppose for black people, it really is three wars. Well, uh, you see, when we talk about, you know, I think in the city of Chicago, 37 young non-white males killed since the beginning of the year. War is about death in every major city. Uh, young non-white men, black and Hispanics, and primarily blacks, are are being killed. And we can say, well, you know, they shouldn't act like this. We need to look at why are they behaving in this manner. And I will address myself to black young people. Because the war of racism, white supremacy, the war for white genetic survival on planet Earth and to prevent white genetic annihilation, the war has attacked their fathers. And so their fathers are not present in the home. The fathers are unemployed. Many of the fathers have gotten caught up in uh, drug involvement either. I maintain that anybody who's drinking and using drugs is depressed. And black males have every right to have a diagnosis of depression because they face in many urban centers 50% unemployment, where half of the men do not have jobs and cannot get jobs. And so a man that's unemployed without a job, he cannot play the role of husband and he cannot play the role of father. Now, if people don't look at the system dynamic, they begin to point the finger at black males and say, well, they're irresponsible. No, there's a deadly war that is going on against black males so that if a black male has some crack, which is another form of cocaine, then he is given a sentence ten times as harsh as a white male who may have a hundred times the quantity Now, that something is significantly wrong with that. It's almost as though it's a trap that is set up to take black males out of the reproductive role because they are all incarcerated with long sentences in the prison system. But they are not at home with their wives and helping to raise their sons, and sons without fathers. I mean, if you had... Let's say you had a, a block on a, on a street block in a community 
And if you had one father out of the, all the houses on the block missing, that's one thing. But when 90% of the fathers are missing, then the black male children or the male children do not have father guidance, father encouragement, father strengthening, and their behavior will become chaotic. And because there might be... Uh, crime in the area because of this disturbed dynamic that is taking place. They can be fearful, so they think they need to join a gang. They think that they need to have guns. They think they need to have pit bulls for protection. This is not because they are bad human beings. There's no such thing as a human being being born bad. No, they are the victims of a structured system that has gone on for centuries, maybe in in modified forms, like there was a period when black people couldn't go in a restaurant, couldn't go to the same bathroom, et cetera, et cetera. But mm. the system can be structured so that the impact comes in any one of the nine areas of people activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. It's just like if you turn on your television today, many of the commercials that feature black men are black men rolling their eyes around and looking stupid. This is not an accident. This is not an accident. I'm thinking of a commercial where you see a black man in an ice cream shop and he dumps the sprinkles all over the counter looking stupid. This is not an accident, but mm -hmm. to the extent that black people are miseducated and confused and think that they are in a system of democracy, then they will begin to think, well, this doesn't have any meaning. This is just a person who is employed to participate in a commercial. Do you see? Or all of the negative yes. images of black people that are in videos and that are in film and we can go back to the end of the civil rights era when black people were sacrificing and giving their lives to make progress and move forward in a system of racism, and white supremacy that was called a segregated society. People gave their lives, were trampled on by horses, were knocked down with fire hoses, and they came out of that struggle talking about black pride, black is beautiful, black power, black self-respect. And the system thought this, anytime people are into a mode of self-respect and admiring themselves, because they were saying that black is beautiful, they weren't saying white is ugly. They were saying, no, when I look in the mirror, I can respect myself as a black person. I think I'm beautiful. I think I'm handsome as a black person. But that's dangerous when people value themselves. So the next wave of activity was black people being paid large sums of money, so-called entertainers, to call themselves niggers, to call themselves dogs, to call themselves gangsters, to call themselves thugs, to call the women bitches and whores. And the complete annihilation of black self-respect, but because people did not understand we are in a system of racism, white supremacy, that mm -hmm. has the goal objective of white genetic survival on planet Earth by any means necessary. And part of that is the destruction of self-respect and dignity of the people who are most feared. There are no people on the planet who were calling themselves those kinds of names, not anybody on the planet, just like there are no people on the planet who were saying that if you study, if you're trying to study, you're acting white. See, but these are the kinds of distortions that were put in place following black people gaining ground and coming out of the civil rights era with a sense of dignity and pride and respect for themselves. And so the system that is about 
maintaining white supremacy for the purpose of white genetic survival knew that it had to attack. It's almost like looking at a chess game. You see, if you think about the game of chess where there's a white side of the board and a black side of the board, and the object of the game of chess, white always moves first, and black has to move following white's move. But the object of the game of chess, if you break down the game and analyze what's its most fundamental objective, the game of chess is about the white king checkmating the black king. So the white king plays offense, defense, so the white side of the board plays offense, defense, and the black side of the board has to play defense, offense. And so we begin to understand this critical dynamic that Dr. Du Bois identified in 1903 in his book, Souls of Black Folks, the problem of the 20th century is the question of the color line, where you can look at the game of chess and say, well, this is a problem of the color line, that white king is determined to checkmate the black king for the purpose of survival. Mm -hmm. So we could, we could really interject, and, and I always say that people who have no awareness, have no, who operate with a lack of consciousness of how white supremacy globally works, that we can have some forgiving for, for, for them. But then when you think about people who came out of our generation, um, uh, Dr. Welsing, uh, people like um, Michael Steele, who came through the civil rights movement and had the opportunity of the momentum of a consciousness. Uh, when you think about Colin Powell uh, and you think about Clarence Thomas, how do we um, combat people who have a had opportunity, who do have opportunity, to kind of be, be, have a more mature perspective about who they are as black people when they are looking at the system and, and its symptoms and how it works? How do we do that? Well, do you see, everybody who may look at a person who has the symptoms, how shall I say it, the symptoms of diabetes or the symptoms of tuberculosis or the symptoms of a gastric ulcer. Not everybody who looks at the person who might be suffering those symptoms who is trained to understand what it is. And so if a person, let's just use, continue that analogy, and let's say that people were in a system structure where the powerful people did not want people to understand diabetes. And so they don't allow any discussion of diabetes, but you have people who are suffering and dying from the condition of diabetes, but nobody is allowed to talk about it. So people can look at it, but they don't understand what they're looking at. Now, somebody who was able to, in spite of the ban, in spite of you're not supposed to understand uh, diabetes, or it's like, you know, during formal enslavement where black people were prevented from reading. I mean, if you were going to try to read, try to learn to read, you might be beaten, your hands might be cut off, or something horrific happening to you. In spite of the pressures against, there were people who decided that they were too going to learn how to read in spite of the ban, in spite of the prohibition. So because racism, white supremacy, the minute a black person starts talking about racism, white supremacy, you have some person who's classified as white start to yell and scream, you're playing the race card, you're playing the race card, you're being a racist. You see, or, or you know, in other words, stop. This is forbidden discussion. Don't you dare go there. I even believe that President Barack Obama, he said he came out, you know, 
talking about in his Philadelphia speech that it was important to have a dialogue about race. The Attorney General Eric Holder said, are we a nation of cowards? Or a nation, you know, said we were a nation of cowards because of our failure and fear to talk about this critical thing that is going on, the most critical thing that is going on on this planet, the entire planet, is racism. But the minute the president says something, hue and cry goes up. The minute the attorney general says something, a hue and cry, he called us cowards. Well, the dictionary says, you know, um, that a coward is somebody who simply avoids talking about something that they're afraid to talk about. They mm-hmm. avoid something that is threatening instead of going straight towards it. So there was nothing wrong with using that language, but because it's talking about racism, talking about the thing that is the most critical thing that can be talked about on the planet. People talk about Guantanamo. Those are non-white people who are being waterboarded. Yes. (laughs) Those were not Germans. Even if we look at all of our wars. If, Those if we look at Iraq, people, white people who were being waterboarded. If we look at see, Palestinians, so the, the system of racism based. We have to be able to mistreat non-white people, in particular non-white males, whenever we want to do so, because they are the threat to white genetic survival. Mm-hmm. And, and and part of this uh, idea where there is an outcry, for instance, yesterday Newt Gendridge, um decried uh, the uh, Sonia Sotomayor as uh, a racist. But he doesn't want to have a discussion about racism. He doesn't want white supremacy and racism to be discussed. And, and that's why they throw rocks and run. Well, this is why black people have to, as calmly as possible, I hope I'm being somewhat calm. Yeah, you're, um, you're being calmer why, than I am. You're good This is for why me. black people have to be able to say to New Gingrich that um, Judge Sotomayor is not a racist. She's a victim. She's a non-white person who has been victimized by racism, white supremacy. And and one of the reasons that uh, we have not in this nation taken up Eric Holder's challenge to have race dialogues, one of the reasons I get most of my email that says you need to get off the issue of black people and race is because we don't want clarity on it. Well, people see the people who classify themselves as white are fearful that if racism is talked about, talked about, talked about, analyzed, discussed, decoded, that their system that they have evolved over time for their genetic survival will fall apart. So that's why there's a, you know, almost an instinctual reaction on their part to avoid this discussion. On the part of black people, we are fearful of antagonizing and upsetting people who for hundreds of years have been able to beat and kill us at will and call it justifiable homicide. You see, Mm -hmm. so black people for hundreds of years and multiple generations have been made fearful consciously and subconsciously about doing something, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of speech, being able to talk about the thing that is causing all the grief in their lives and causing black people to have shorter lifespans than people who classify themselves as white and black men to have the shortest lifespan of everybody because the attack is most heavily on them, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. women are not perceived as being able to cause genetic annihilation because women cannot impose sexual intercourse. 
See, if a woman got a weapon and, you know, M16 rifle and said to a man, you are going to have sexual intercourse with me, the man would get frightened and lose an erection if he had one. So it's the male who is perceived as the threat to white genetic survival and therefore attack. And I said in my first paper, The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism, the challenge for white behavioral scientists is to help people who classify themselves as white, to help white people come to conscious terms with their reality on planet Earth, that they are a tiny minority. They are not the majority. They are the non-white global minority on planet Earth, and they are genetic recessive in terms of skin coloration, and therefore they can be genetically annihilated, which they are fearful of. But that fear of genetic annihilation was the conscious and subconscious thinking that made white people gather and capture and lynch a black man and cut off his genitals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dr. Welsing, do do you have a sense that uh, if you, that black people in general have a greater understanding or response uh, to white uh, supremacy since you began your first work, which was in the uh, in the sixties. I uh, say that again. I'm sorry, I didn't get the first. Do, part of do you have a? Do you believe that black people have a greater understanding to white supremacy of white supremacy since you began your work? Because I have not seen any other uh, African American or black psychiatry uh, psychiatrist doing any of the work in regard to white supremacy and the system of global white supremacy um, as a a method of helping us understand the system, uh, why aren't there more psychoanalytical papers and conferences? I mean, people use the word racism, but uh, nobody's using the word white supremacy, global white supremacy uh, system. Well, because of fear. I mean, as I said earlier, you can lose employment. When I wrote the paper, The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism, I was a professor of pediatrics at Howard University College of Medicine. And after being on the faculty seven years, I was expecting to have tenure. And then I heard on the faculty grapevine that I was going to be denied tenure because of my political ideas. And so I went directly to the then dean, and I said, I'm sure you understand I'm interested in tenure, but I'm hearing on the faculty grapevine that I'm going to be denied tenure because of my political ideas. And he said, that's right, that paper that you wrote. Now, he didn't even know the name of the paper. Mm Mm-hmm. But the only paper that I had written that talked about publicly was the Crest Theory. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, what about, what about the Crest Theory? And he said, it doesn't make sense for you to say that white people are envious of black people because of their color. <laughs> you see, now we've just seen an example of... Um, people who classify themselves as white their hysteria about color and I say that you know all the uh, excitement or what do we call it uh, uproar that went up about Michelle Obama having on a sleeveless dress and people started white people started talking about white women started talking about the musculature in her arms I say they were excited about the color of her arms And thank you for being with us here tonight. Those of you who have joined us in the ustalknetwork.com chat room and those of you who are listening, you're listening to Our Common Ground. And our guest tonight is Dr. Francis Cress-Welsing. And we are talking about white supremacy, 
a system of global white supremacy and how it operates and what you need to understand about all of the events that have been going on, um, even during um, your entire lifetime, that this is nothing new, that we are at war. Um, Dr. Welsing, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and I wanted to get your against us, yes. And the, and the question is, my question is always, so what are you doing in your war? Um, how are you defining your role in the war that is being waged against you? And one of the things, uh, a house music lover, thank you so much, because um, you're absolutely right, and Dr. Welsing has made the, the point tonight that racism is a symptom, white supremacy is the disease. It is the system in which we have to operate, and we've got to figure out uh, which side of the the game board we're on. I, I want to get your opinion about the wars that the ag- the the international aggravations, uh, the war on Iraq, uh, this constant um, this constant poking at Iran, our, our, our unending and feverish support of Israel in striking against the Palestinian people, our negligence as though Haiti does not exist, and our war against brown people uh, on, from, our, from our borders uh, called the war against immigration in the context of white supremacy. Look, can you talk about that? On the planet today are wars in which people who are classified as non-white are dying in large numbers, whether it's in the Middle East or whether it's in Africa or whether it is in South or Central America, that it is people who are classified as non-white who are dying and being killed. It's just like HIV is killing large numbers of non-white people, primarily people in the continent of Africa as well as black people here in this area of the world. And so that tells us something if we, in fact, understand the context that we are in a power construct of local, national, global racism, white supremacy, Uh, the different ways in which carrying out the domination of people of color or the pretexts for taking the resources that are in parts of the world where people of color live and so pretexts are set up so that you know people in other words if people feel inadequate in terms of their genetics and in terms of their numbers on the planet that sense of inadequacy will fuel greed and it will fuel having i have to have everything i have to have all of the oil all of the gold all of the diamonds all of the money i have to have it all and I have to be able to look at people of color and see them in a state of impoverishment, like the pictures that they show us of starving African children or starving Haitians, that, you know, on the surface somebody might say, oh, I'm going to go and give them, you know, some movie star. I'm going to go and give them some tents or some bread. But I'll not I am children. going to end the system of racism, white supremacy. So the things that we see happening on the planet are all aspects and dimensions of racism, white supremacy, but it is never talked about in these terms. But I say that black people, uh, you know, those black people who feel that they want to solve the problems on the planet, not just complain. Well, if they want to solve the planet, problems on the planet, they have to make in-depth analysis of what is going on and be determined that they're going to talk about it 
and they're going to do something about it. And you see, when you think in terms of the numbers on the planet, if one-tenth of the people on the planet are white and nine-tenths of the people on the planet are non-white, for the one-tenth to control the nine-tenths, they have to have a lot of support from the nine-tenths. Are you following me? Yes. So I'm, I'm, if the nine-tenths mm-hmm. of the people on the planet hate themselves because they're not white, then they are upholding the system of racism, white supremacy. They are reinforcing its continuing existence. And so it's not the answer is not hating white people, but the answer lies in the nine-tenths of people learning how to look in the mirror and decide that they like themselves and they respect themselves and they don't have to be white or have long straight hair for them to have respect for themselves. But this is work that all of the people, as I said earlier, all of the people, non-white people on the planet, after the hundreds of years of indoctrination from the system of racism, white supremacy, I would dare say that the majority of non-white people don't like themselves as non-white people. And so they're willing to war against people who look like them, fight Mm -hmm. and kill people who look like them, Mm -hmm. as opposed to saying halt to the one-tenth global minority and say, no, we're not going to have wars of racism, white supremacy. We're going to stop wars, and we are going to have peace on the planet and we're going to have justice on the planet, so nobody is being mistreated. Nobody is being mistreated. And I mean nobody is being mistreated. Mm-hmm. You White, know, black, the, brown, red, or yellow. And those of, who need the most help get the most help. One of the things that has occurred to me over and over, just a consistent thought that I've had about your theory is that when we begin to understand ourselves as the victim of a system, then we can begin to identify the behaviors uh, of uh, in the system of mass oppression and begin to identify our responses, a correct response to it. And it really is a path to a new kind of humanity. But you don't see scholars using the, the, the construct of global white supremacy in their work when they are talking about the symptoms. Well, so you can't get grants and you can't maintain your position, a professor or whatever, whatever, and talk about racism, white supremacy. Now, you can have, uh, there are a couple of people who classify themselves as white who go around lecturing about white supremacy, do you see? But they don't talk about it in the terms that I talk about it. And they started Mm -hmm. talking about it following Neely Fuller talking about a global system of white supremacy. Do you see? But they don't talk about where I take the, the causation and the motivation that it is because people who classify themselves as white are a minority that is genetic recessive. And the people that these whites are talking to are basically non-white people. They're not going to white people and talking about you need to bring the system of racism, white supremacy to an end, sort of like a John Brown. They're not Mm -hmm. doing that, but they are posturing and posing themselves as people who are talking about white supremacy and... uh, Let's not talk about any genetic fear of genetic annihilation. I won't name mm-hmm. the people, but they're out there. People can <laughs> I know the people that you're talking And find about. out who, who they are. Do you see? Yes. But black people, and Neely Fuller talks about there are four possible ways of victims of racism responding to the oppression. They can submit to it. They can, in that submission would include denying the denial that it exists, right? Uh, Submission, cooperation, resistance, and destruction.
destruction of destruction of are those simply the people like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and the people who were told in one way or the other, if you don't stop talking about this, you're going to be killed. And they continued talking about what they felt needed to be talked about in spite of overt threats to their lives. Do you see? But the submission and cooperation that's what the system can tolerate on the part of non-white people, the resistance to it, uh, mm-hmm. meaning, you know, continuing to talk about racism and white supremacy. Now, cooperation means uh, just give me, I know that it's a problem, but just give me a good job and I'll be content. Uh, but resistance, I, I maintain that as a psychiatrist, that you cannot have self-respect if you are not resisting your degradation and your uh, oppression. Mm-hmm. Your, do, you, do you see? And this the process is what, of inferior life, in, in, the, making right, you inferior. If you don't yes. resist inferiorization, then you cannot possibly have self-respect. And, you know, one way of looking and our children being so destructive, I mean, black children, those who are just in a destructive mode, uh, children behave in that way when the adults are not giving them the protection that is due children. Children don't ask to be born. And so if they are brought in the world, their birth contract is, I will be protected and I will be taken care of. Do you see? But when people Mm -hmm. have been oppressed and demeaned and degraded, they start degrading sexual activity and playing with sex. I say, you know, when sex is played with, sex is magnificent. It's the way that we reproduce ourselves on the planet. But under oppression and under the specific oppression of racism and white supremacy, Sex is demeaned and sex is degraded. And when people start playing with sex, I say the joke is on the offspring. So we have tens of thousands of throwaway black children. Those are the children in foster care. People were playing with sex, didn't understand what they were doing, unable to take care of and protect the children that they bring into the world. And that's simply, they just did not understand. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you see, they did not understand, yeah. just like the octomom doesn't understand that you cannot take care of 14 little children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and part of the problem, uh, as I see it, as we try to resist and throw off this inferiorized state of being, is that we're dealing with one part of the problem, but we're not dealing with the other part of the problem. Well, see, not, people, oh, excuse me, go ahead, I'm sorry. We're not boxing the problem. You know, we're not dealing with the people who are playing with the sex. We're not dealing with the system that has been set up to further the trauma the, the trauma of the outcome. Right, well, see, this is why the first, in other words, sometimes people talk about the black agenda. You know how many times have we heard that? <laughs> but what is the black you know, in the con, what in the is framework the black agenda? <laughs> of understanding racism, and white supremacy as a power construct that is destructive. I mean, it cannot help but, you know, when a minority of the people on the planet are determined to control the majority, you have a system of injustice. Uh, but when people begin to understand what racism, and white supremacy is, and Neely Fuller says, if you do not understand... Racism. White supremacy, racism, what it is Every- and exactly how it works. Can everything I say it? everything you, else that just you simply think you serves will only confuse you. I love, you know, I, I'm, I must say that twice a day. I have been saying that for years, like twice a day. And people don't, un, until they understand what the system of white, global white supremacy is, then they can't understand that. Well, imagine, of... imagine a surgeon 
who doesn't understand anatomy trying to do a heart transplant. Yes. Or a surgeon who doesn't understand anatomy and the anatomy of the brain trying to separate conjoined twins. No, you have to understand, and this is where the importance of education and knowledge, like I say when I'm lecturing many times, reading is more important than watching TV or the Internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, (laughs) Reading mm -hmm. is more important than watching TV. And see, the, the black agenda is that we must understand racism, white supremacy, what it is and how it works. Not spend any time, energy, hating white people. Understand that white people found themselves in a dilemma of being a minority on the planet that's genetic recessive. In fact, it's a mutation from black people, but that's another lecture. And that yes. they can they set up a system for their survival and they are going to practice surviving. But we can begin to understand what it is and why they are doing what they're doing in economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, and be determined that we are going to stop being a buffoon people, that we are Mm -hmm. going to be some of the most serious people on the planet who are treating ourselves with a high level of seriousness and self-respect, we don't need to. If I could wave a magic wand, black people can stop singing and can stop dancing. We have done enough dancing. Everybody has a Ph.D. in dancing and singing and clowning and playing ball. (laughs) What we need to do is begin to get a Ph.D. in black seriousness. Yes following and understanding, and then Neely Fuller laid out some behaviors that are really like basic training in justice. And it's, you know, like stop name-calling one another. Stop gossiping about one another. Stop squabbling with one another. Stop cursing one another. Stop being discourteous and disrespectful to one another. Stop stealing from one another. Stop robbing one another. Stop fighting one another. And stop killing one another. Now, these may seem to be simple behaviors, but the converse of this, like name-calling, cursing, snitching, being discourteous and being disrespectful, All of these are reflections of having been taught to hate self and to hate the reflection of yourself, which is what programming in a system of racism, white supremacy, for black or other non-white people. Mm -hmm. And so these may seem very simple, but they're like basic training in the production of justice. And I say justice is a byproduct. It's not something that somebody gives you. Justice is a byproduct of self-respect. You see, when your self-respect reaches a certain level, you will insist upon there being justice, and you mm-hmm. will you know, bring to bear those behaviors that will bring justice into being. It won't be whining and complaining, why isn't somebody else doing something? I've added to these, I stop, I say stop making black children think that as children they can be adequate mothers and fathers. Black parents need to be married before sex and they need to be 30 years old before they think of having children and they need to spend the first 30 years getting an education, vocational training, whatever is necessary to Mm -hmm. accomplish Mm self-sufficiency. You see, because I tell people a bird has a tiny brain, but it knows enough to build a nest before it lays an egg. <laughs> I, lo- I love that. Let me, let me ask you about you. You have about. been, about you. <laughs> I think that we have to know people's stories. 
in order to find the model. And I have admired and and respected and and I, I spent some time in my life being a worshiper of your work. Tell us about when you were, how did you remember, uh, who were these people that gave you these messages so that you had the courage to stand tall in what you thought was right in your profession, what you thought was right on behalf of black people? I know you and I have talked about growing up as race people. I mean, my family was a race, race we were race people. Well, uh, you know, I give all credit to my parents and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, the way that they uh, were focused. My mother was a Chicago public school teacher, a graduate of the University of Chicago. My father was a physician. His father was a physician. My father was a graduate of medical school at the University of Illinois. And so I just feel extremely fortunate. And my grandmother, uh, paternal grandmother, raised us, lived in our home 24-7. And she talked about her husband who had died in 1909. And she would always say, your grandfather was a race man. That meant that he held as the highest priority what was happening to black people mm-hmm. and my grandfather had written something and I didn't see it until long after I had started writing and my father pulled out some papers old papers from his father and my grandfather who died in 1909 had written about how dare people think that they are superior based on the color of their skin Mm-hmm. Now, I just thought that was remarkable. I never knew him. But then for me to become a psychiatrist and start writing about racism, white supremacy. But uh, let me just say, my parents were uh, politically oriented people. They valued ideas more important than having the latest car. And my uncles were people who were into politics and my uncle had room with Paul Robeson in New York when one of my uncles, uh, Richard Wright, had started writing Black Boy in the home of my godmother mm-hmm. in Chicago. Who so was these your godmother? Are all people who, excuse me? <laughs> who was your godmother? Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know the name. I'm just saying these are all people mm-hmm. who were in Chicago, passing through Chicago, who were politically focused and politically oriented. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, You see, mm -hmm. I went to school where in Chicago, public school, uh, elementary school, public school, high school, where we had black teachers in elementary school, all black teachers, and our teachers taught us, you have to be ten times as good. They didn't say anything about racism, white supremacy. That's right. But the expression was, you have to be ten times as good mm-hmm. because of mm-hmm. what is going on in the larger society and in the larger world. And those teachers were focused on, we were going to learn, yes. and we were going to behave ourselves and conduct ourselves in a particular way. So, yeah. you know, like if you say, well, you know, what... What supports did you have growing up? You know, I just have to give all credit to my parents and their focusing and their understanding the importance of education and their understanding of respecting yourself as a black person. You don't Mm -hmm. grow up and try to leave your community and get away from your people. You mm-hmm. go and get an education so that you can contribute to the well-being and welfare of your people. So, yeah. you know, that's base orientation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That if somebody mm-hmm. said, well, why are you who you are? That's why I am who I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, we, and we lived in a time, and it's something that we need to reclaim, 
that we had pride in people who loved us. That was the magic of uh, Malcolm, and that was the magic of Marcus Garvey, and that was the ma the magic of um, Dr. Martin Luther King, that our parents understood that these were people who had their back. And in having their back, they turn the favor. And, and, and I think that sometimes we have, we well, are see, so people scattered. People can be uh, confused as to um, what they're supposed to do based on the kind of information that comes to them or the mm -hmm. kind of ideas that come to them. And, you know, when I graduated from college, I told my parents, my parents said, what do you want for graduation? I said, send me to Germany. This is 1957. Mm -hmm. I want to live mm -hmm. with German people, and I want to ask them, did they understand what they were doing to their neighbors? I was in a work camp outside of Frankfurt where German young people were still going around 12 years after the end of the war and, you know, wearing swastikas and doing Heil Hitler. Yes, yes. And But I learned from that experience that people did understand and that people that on the surface looked like nice people, but they had participated or they had knowledge about uh, some people in their midst who were Semites of the Jewish religion who were being carted off and who were killed. And, you know, that was very important information for me because if you read the work of Adolf Hitler, Hitler said he wasn't against uh, the Semites of the Jewish religion because of their religion. Their religion didn't matter to him. He said they were not white. They were not Aryan. And he wanted to have a white, pure society. And so, therefore, the people who had color, this is, in other words, he didn't want white to be genetically annihilated right, with people right. who were carrying genetic material from the Middle East and Africa, because the word Semite means mulatto, people who are a mixture of black and white. And so Hitler yeah. said, I'm going to kill 11 million of them. I'm going to rid Europe. Now, that is not, you know, people talk about the Holocaust, but they don't talk about the why of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. They don't go back and even focus on what did Hitler himself say. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a variation of racism, white supremacy, and mm -hmm. behavior that evolves from white genetic survival. Yes. And Sigmund Freud... Take... Oh. Go ahead. Sigmund I was going to say, Sigmund Freud is considered the Western world's greatest behavioral scientist. But Freud, being a Semite of the Jewish religion, couldn't talk about anti-Semitism. And did. Wow. Wow. We've got to take a break, Dr. Uh, Welfing, but when we come back, I want to talk about how we participate in our own oppression. I'm Janice Graham. This is Our Common Ground. Our guest tonight, I'm in conversation with Dr. Francis Press Welfing, and I am honored to be so. Stay with us. We'll be right back, and we'll take your calls, 954-530-2068. Listening to our Common Ground with Janice Graham on USTalkNetwork.com. And thank you again for being with us at our Common Ground. I'm Janice Graham, and tonight we are so honored and so pleased to be able to be in conversation with Dr. Francis Chris Welsing. And uh, for those of you who do not know of her work, do not know of her life, on the blog at U.S. Talk Network, I have provided a complete listing of all of her work. Uh, and after the show, I will also uh, provide some links that you can study 
uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing because, um, you know, if we are to survive uh, a behavioral system, this behavioral system for, if we are to survive, we've got to understand what the rules are, what the definition is. You know, I would love to have been a, fly, uh, a reporter to ask Newt Gendrich yesterday, excuse me, but what is your definition of racism since you know so much about racism? <laughs> Dr. Welsing, thank you so much again for being with us. Before we were go went to break, you were talking about, you know, that's a very unique because most people get history of all kind wrong. And most people will tell you that the, ho the Jewish Holocaust was about religion. It was about religion? Yes. And no, most well, Jewish people don't talk about Hitler. it. They just have to read Hitler. They right. have to read Hitler's Mein Kampf because Hitler says what, it, you know, what his idea was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, in other words, that's a read, 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 and read some more. Gain knowledge and, and understanding of what is going on on this planet. And don't, you know, feel that watching television or even, you know, even being on the Internet and use space and Twitter. Yeah. We have to be very careful that we are not See, on Twittering the might be trivial, trivialization. Yes. Uh, we have to be careful that we're not on the intertrash. There is an internet and there is an intertrash. And a lot of us are getting information off the intertrash. And it's not accurate. And um, what we need to do is build libraries for our homes. Exactly. And the ISIS papers ought to be. I mean, one of the things at, at, at Kwanzaa, at Christmas, at birthdays, we ought to be giving our children books. Real books, not Johnny got a cat named Dot. That's not a real book. And if there is not a book that you want to address for for you want to address an issue of race or address an issue of our history, get on the computer and make one. I make books all the time because I want children to know something and there's no book available. But it ought to be garnered from good sources. Well, uh, see, again, we also have to understand, like within the system of racism, making black people the inferiorization or making black people dysfunctional or telling black people your role is to be an entertainer. Do you see? Or your role is yeah. to be a ball player. Now, these can be excellent activities, but we need to identify ourselves as, number one, we are the parent people on this planet. The creator of the universe made black people the mothers and fathers of everybody on this planet, and human life began in Africa. And we are even white people's parents because they are genetic mutations to albinism. That's what white skin is. Mm -hmm. And it is defined by white scientists themselves, even though when they're, you know, they'll talk about a white mouse and a white rat or a white tiger and say this is a genetic deficiency state. But this is why white people, you know, they on Home Shopping Network last week, there were white women who were saying we've got to get rid of this pale winter white skin and put mm -hmm. on this tanning. And you can put on so many layers, and they were looking darker than Michelle Obama. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about genetically modified melanin. Uh, and it's now being combined with uh, libido-enhancing properties. I don't know anything about that. Baby. Oh, okay. I have, I have not, I've not heard but you're about not, that. But you're not surprised not, based on the... Not, based on not the, at all surprised, but I'm saying that Let's go back to the fact that we are the parent people on the planet. And parents are supposed to be very, very serious. Someone once told me that Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, was asked, what is the role of the Negro? 
And Gandhi said that the role of the Negro was to bring justice and peace to the planet. Now, mm-hmm. whether you, you know, take what Gandhi said, but we need to, the planet is lacking in justice and peace. And people are being killed and destroyed. The planet is being destroyed. So the, pl- the parent people should be the people that step forward and say, wait a minute, we are going to take ourselves totally seriously. We're going to be serious about ourselves and be serious about the maximal development of our genetic and constitutional potential. And we are going to be the people who are going to work to bring justice on this planet and to replace racism, white supremacy, with a global system of justice. That's mm-hmm. the folk. See, in other words, you know, like we kind of, the where we are now, uh, you know, you ask a lot of black children, well, what, what are you going to do when you're all grown up? I don't know. I don't know. You see, we don't have a broad mission or long-range mission. Imagine if we as black people, you know, we practice the behaviors that Neely Fuller laid out. We were courteous and respectful to one another, and we were not fighting and killing each other and being uh, and using and selling drugs to one another or making children think that they could be adequate parents when they are little children. What if we were stepped into the mold of people who are engaged in the exercises of black self-respect, black mental health, and counter-racism, and that we said our mission on the planet is to be the people who are going to insist that racism, white supremacy be replaced with justice. Mm-hmm. And you just said that. Are. That's what your parents did for you. And clowns. Mm-hmm. We are the people who had the cosmic assignment, apparently, the universal assignment to be the first people on this planet. And we are going to treat ourselves with that level of seriousness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and we've got to, to be resistors. For instance, I wanted to get your opinion on what you thought about this new Amos and Andy kind of media that goes on with shows about black people, particularly around like Tyler Perry and um, some of these other, what we call entertainment, and they're supposed to be representative. See, well, that's, in other words, that is necessary uh, media and psychological input when you want to destroy black people. You see how Mm -hmm. any, you know, the role that grandmothers have played in the salvation of black people in their struggles under racism, white supremacy, how anybody could demean a grandmother. Do you see, but that is as, what shall I say, as serious as a black man dressing up as a woman. Mm-hmm. where the system of racism seeks to turn the black man into a female, to completely annihilate black male masculinity. Do you see? So when people mm-hmm. are sitting up and laughing at Tyler Perry and laughing at his degrading the image of a grandmother, I'm certain that he doesn't understand anything at all about racism and white supremacy, so he has fallen completely into that pit of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Grandmothers are people who brought us over. And during the civil rights era, Bill Withers, the singer, had a song called Grandma's Hands. And that's right. And as uh, Dr. Julia Hare would say, the bridges that brought us say over. The grandmother's hands, because grandmothers Mm -hmm. rocked and held and cradled and helped us to survive and develop. Mm -hmm. and that we would reach the 21st century with a black president, and then you have, you know, a black man demeaning grandmothers. That's just Mm -hmm. like the media who wanted to talk about Michelle Obama's mother living in the White House and helping her raise her children, their grandmother. 
Well, is the grandmother going to be there? Well, who's going to pay? For Come on. We are, you know, if, if you worship idols, grandmothers ought to be on that pedestal. Mm-hmm. But again, that's all a part of us being demeaned and degraded as a people and not having a clue as to what is happening to us. But we must break through that level of ignorance and arrive at in-depth understanding and be determined that we are going to transform ourselves and we are not going to be begging people who classify themselves as white to change us. We're going to transform ourselves based on our understanding and our will to be who we were put on this planet to be in the first instance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, um, one of the other points is how we conduct our political behavior. Uh, I am just one of those people that is appalled that as a people, we made a commitment to our brothers and sisters in New Orleans who were victims of Katrina and of our government, that we would have their back, that we would support them, that we would make sure that they, they would survive. And they are not surviving. The schools in New Orleans... Uh, many of the the schools are still under under have not been rehabilitated or repaired. Uh, uh, on June first, twelve thousand five hundred and some people, mostly black, will lose their emergency housing vouchers and will become homeless. Most of them, or have to leave the city. And and that is a kind of behavior that when we don't understand that this is a war that was declared deliberate by somebody policy. else. Exactly. Deliberate. Absolutely deliberate. And it's all part of this system. I mean, See, well, there wanted... were business people in New Orleans who, you know, some time ago there was an article even in the Wall Street Journal who, you know, where this is good. We always wanted to have these black people removed so we could make New Orleans what we want it to be. You see, but Mm -hmm. again, if this is the racism, white supremacy mindset that maybe allowed the um, levees to break in the first place or didn't fix them right in the first place, whatever, Do you see, then we should talk about it in these terms. But as long as we don't have a broad and global framework of understanding as to why all of these various things happen, so that we can petition, position ourselves, take ourselves seriously. I mean, imagine... uh, the black people in New Orleans are drowning, starving, or homeless, or whatever, and black people are dancing around and calling themselves niggers and dogs and gangsters and thugs. Oh, and so the then people thing. who listen to that, and they would say, you know, young white people were the ones who were listening to a lot of that trashy gangster rap. They were just getting an education for their generation to understand these are people who don't value themselves. They don't need jobs. They don't need housing in New Orleans. They're life unworthy of life, which is one of the things that Hitler said about the Semites of the Jewish religion. After he, you know, portrayed them in the propaganda that was in the newspapers and the magazines as germs and uh, tear mints, as German for subhuman. And so then the people, you know, were comfortable. Well, they're going to cart them away and burn them up. Well, you know, they're life unworthy of life. Mm -hmm. And so these Mm -hmm. images that so-called movie stars and the videos where black people and the music that some of the people started singing and listening to. And then we talk about, well, let's get housing for the people in New Orleans. It's a contradiction. Yes. 
Yes. So this is why we need to understand the importance of self-respect and have an understanding that when it is being taken away from you, like I don't know what the situation is in Florida, but people here in the District of Columbia and in Chicago talk about the behavior of black children in schools. Teaching can't go on because the behavior is so out of line. There are no people on this entire planet who are clowning and acting up in school. No other people on the entire planet are the children getting on public transportation and using the foul language Mm -hmm. that our children are using and the behavior that is the complete annihilation of self-respect. Well, your work has been very clear that under this system, they set up whatever pretense is needed to justify going in and taking control over the resources that we do have. And that non-white people feel that, I mean, white people in this system feel that non-white people are not supposed to have any means to protect and defend themselves from this ultimate aggression. And we've given them a lot of demonstrated evidence that we are not going to resist in a way or respond in a way that is appropriate to break the system. Well, Um, this is why... Go ahead. Go ahead. No. No, I was just going to say, this is why we absolutely have to understand there's an African proverb that says each one teach one. And it's like I often say, you know, if I'm giving a talk, if I were to tell a dirty joke at a lecture, <laughs> I can't imagine. that dirty joke would go from Washington, <laughs> D.C. to Los Angeles it would in 24 hours, mm-hmm. if not nine hours. You would be back in on other the words, national headlines. People, people, but people would call, did you hear this joke? Did you hear this? Mm-hmm. Or if I was to teach a new dance step. You know, we put our arms around each other and teach the new, latest dance step. Yeah. And so we have to decide that concepts and ideas that relate to the condition that we are in, that we are going to help each other understand the importance of thinking about these issues. And we are going to understand the importance of transforming our behavior to reflect that we indeed respect ourselves. See, that's countering racism, white supremacy. Racism, white supremacy, I need you to be in a demeaned, degraded, inferiorized condition. Instead Mm -hmm. of us just blindly falling into that trap, it's like we have to say, absolutely no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It should be a war cry, absolutely no. Dr. Wilson, we've run out of time, and I have been so honored to have this conversation with you. Uh, We do want you to come back. We want to do do a teach-in. And we want to schedule it so that you will come in and just do your teaching. You know, one of the things we didn't touch on is religion and how our religious institutions have become that. Or this how they new... reflect right. the system of white supremacy. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Well, thank and... you for inviting me, and I hope that your listening audience got something out of our discussion. Well, I am sure that they did. I am sure that they did. And uh, you'll hear from me very soon. All right. Do take care. Have a good evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was our sister doctor, Frances Cress Welsing. She has been a shero of mine, uh, I would say, since uh, 1966. How about that? And uh, I was so honored. Uh, to have her with us this evening. And I encourage each and uh, every one of you, if you have not read the ISIS papers, to read it. 
And if you have not read her other works there, some of her papers and her lectures are online, and I will be providing some links where you can hear more of what she has to say. Thank you for joining us at Our Common Ground with Janice Graham, transforming truth to power, one broadcast at a time. Thank you for your support of Our Common Ground. Please join us at www.ourcommonground.com where you can find our archives, best black minds, and black thought leadership discussions with and about black history and culture, black struggle and liberation, black authors, black activists, black nation building solutions and ideas, transforming truth to power, one broadcast at a time.